Section 53 of A Minor War History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. A Minor War History by Martin Alonzo Haynes. Letter 146. Headquarters, 2nd, NHV. Point of Rocks, Virginia, May 18, 1864. This morning I received your letter, dated from Manchester. Yesterday I sent a letter off directed to New London, but as you have concluded not to go there, I suppose your chances of getting it right off are not very good. So to relieve your anxiety, I write again. Our date of discharge has at last been definitely settled and you need not expect to see me before the 7th of June. That is General Butler's fiat, which is law. This army has had some fighting to do since it landed here. At this very moment the rebels are attacking a portion of our entrenched line not half a mile from where I am sitting, and there is a terrific uproar of cannon and musketry. A week ago the army went out on an expedition to stir up the rebels. They skirmished with them, drove them toward Fort Darling, and took the outer line of rifle pits. I took the regimental mail up and found the boys within five hundred yards of a large rebel fort, over which two big garrison flags were floating. They were behind a good log breastwork, and our skirmishes were well out in front behind logs and stumps, hopping away so industriously that the rebels were not working a single one of their cannon. I stayed as long as I could find any excuse to distribute my mail and to watch the sport, then rode back to camp. The next morning before I had rolled out of my blankets I heard heavy firing up the river and knew that a battle was on. It was a couple of hours before I could get started with my mail. The road after I had gone a piece was full of wounded men on foot and ambulances loaded with mangled humanity. One driver told me he had in his wagon the body of Captain Platt, who was killed by a bullet in the head. When I reached the regiment I learned the full story of the fight. The morning was a very foggy one and the rebels crawled silently toward our lines and then rushed for our breastworks but there was an obstacle in the path that they hadn't dreamed of. Our fellows had busied themselves during the night in weaving telegraph wires among the stumps out at the front, and when the Rebs charged, they suddenly found themselves sprawling every which way, while our boys were pumping lead into them as fast as they could load and fire. The Rebs came on again and again, until the ground in front of the second was carpeted with dead and wounded rebels. But the rebels managed to get through the lines to the right and the left, and the army fell back and formed a new line of battle a mile or less to the rear of the old position. Although there was light skirmishing all day, at some points the rebels had done about all the attacking they cared to for one day. I stayed with the regiment all day to see the fun if there was any more going. One time I thought there would be. The brigade was called to attention and moved forward in battle line, across the fields, toward the woods, where the morning's fight had taken place. Old Buckskin and I thoughtlessly jogged along behind the second. Before we were within ordinary rifle range of the woods, a bullet pinged by, not far from me. Pretty soon there was another and then another. Looking up and down, I saw I was the only mounted man on the line, and it dawned upon me that some sharpshooter with a long-range rifle had picked me out as the boss of the expedition and was trying to get me. And he could shoot, too. My pride wouldn't let me turn and run, badly as I wanted to, and I was about to drop to the ground and walk when the bugle sounded a halt and we about faced and marched back, and I was mighty glad to go. During the night our army came back into the camps, 
this morning the rebels appeared in front of our lines and lively skirmishing has been going on all day the army is engaged in throwing up entrenchments the second working as hard as any of them end of letter 146 letter 147 headquarters second nhv near petersburg virginia may 24 1864 the discharge of veteran regiments in this command has already begun yesterday i went down to bermuda hundred with my tent mate johnny powell and on our way back we met the first connecticut heavy artillery on their way home their time having expired the present camp of the second is delightfully located in a beautiful pine grove shady cool and clean just to the rear of our rifle pits i now have about fifteen minutes work each day carrying the outgoing mail down to brigade headquarters a distance of a dozen rods and bringing the regimental mail up over the same course colonel bailey is determined to go home when we do and probably will the regiment will then be reduced below the minimum entitling it to a colonel also if war department orders are enforced it will have to be consolidated into companies of one hundred men each and superfluous officers mustered out bailey has written to major davis general butler's assistant adjutant general expressing his wish to be mustered out with the old men and stating the facts in regard to the regiment his wife i know has set her foot down against his staying in the army longer than he's obliged to just as mine did we are having a very quiet time along the lines just now for two or three days there has hardly been a shot fired we have entrenchments behind which we can defy the whole rebel army but the other night we had noise enough down a little to our right i had just turned in when it started and in five minutes there was such a riot that our regiment turned out and manned the breastworks but our section of the line was not molested and in half an hour the firing had degenerated into an occasional straggling shot and the regiment turned in again well as bill pendleton says every day is like an inch on a man's nose end of letter one forty seven letter one forty eight headquarters second n h v near petersburg virginia friday may twenty seven eighteen sixty four in my last letter written three days ago i promised to write one more letter from the army the chances are that if i do not write now i may not have another opportunity as we are evidently getting in trim to move within a day or two and we may not get settled down again until we are discharged last night an order came here that all men in the regiment who are unable to travel in light marching order shall be sent at once to the division hospital we will doubtless move very soon perhaps before tomorrow morning hen pillsbury has just come in with the news coming from dr moreau that we will march within a few hours a good part of butler's force going to reinforce grant if so we will have some hard marching to do now that the time for my release draws nigh i must say i'm getting very impatient bill ramsdell says when i get my discharge in my hand i shall feel as if i have shaken off a man who for three years has had his hand at my throat trying to strangle me and with his experience i do not wonder that he feels that way since i began this letter the preparations for departure have set in in good earnest the shovels which we have used in throwing up defensive works are being loaded up the sick men have taken up their line of march for the hospitals and the cooks are busy preparing two days rations if grant has got lee back pretty well toward richmond it may not be a very hard march to join him but if he is still at the anna rivers we will have some right smart huffing to do 
at any rate i will not be troubled with a heavy load only what i may need to make myself comfortable i have turned in my horse and will frog it with the boys which will be rather pleasant and i will not have the horse to care for it has been some time since i have received a letter from you but suppose you do not write for fear i may not get it being liable to start for home any day good-bye for a very short time end of letter one forty nine this was the soldier boy's last letter from the army the eighteenth army corps did join grant being transported to white house on the pamunkey by water the second gloriously maintained its ancient reputation in the sanguinary battle of cold harbor and an ill fate took heavy toll from the little handful of old men whose faces were already turned joyously toward home and the loved ones three company commanders including captain gordon were killed and the rank and file were decimated immediately after this terrible sacrifice the remnant returned to new hampshire and were mustered out end of section fifty three recording by john brandon End of a Minor War History by Martin Alonzo Haynes